Good in your evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, this is uh, such a wonderful opportunity we have to learn about um, our interpretation of the music of Bach using modern instruments, and how lucky we are to have our presenters, Tommy Morse and Kang Wan Kim tonight. My name is Melanie DeJesus, and I'm the Interim Artistic Director of Bach Around the Clock this year. And I'm so delighted to be able to share this evening with you. Um, a special thank you to our sponsor, Linda Clifford, for making this evening possible. So let's all sit back and enjoy.
you very much for coming today. I was given the permission to take off my mask when I'm talking, so I hope you don't mind. My name is Kangwon Kim, and I'm a Baroque violinist, and I also play modern violin. I live in Madison. I teach from home, and I play with a group called Madison Bach Musicians. Um, I have started playing the violin when I was seven, but I didn't start my Baroque violin until I got to college. So Baroque violin is something that was quite new to me um, after I have actually become a, a pretty advanced violinist. Um, we just played Sonata in A major for violin and harpsichord, BWV 1015 by Bach. That was the first and second movement. When I was in college, I didn't even know this piece existed. Um, it's one of those things, once you get into um, knowing the music of Bach and what's available, you really become more addicted. And I'm going to start with that, that I think this is something I do not present it as something that I have perfected and I have um, gotten to the point that I am I'm calling myself an expert but I would like to say that I am just asking you to join me in my journey of learning um, what it's all about and why some people are really obsessed with the early music movement and with Bach. So I own two violins. Um, one is the one that you just heard, the Baroque violin, and the other one is the one that uh, it's called Modern Violin, and that's the one that you would hear when you go to Madison Symphony Concert. So these are, my, these are my two violins. As you can see, the shape is not very different, and even the size is not very different. The difference between Modern Violin and Baroque Violin is that there's no chin rest and there's no shoulder rest on Baroque violin. It was not until um, 1820, Louis Spohr uh, invented the chin rest for the violinists so that we can lean on it and do better in our shifting. It made the shifting very, very, e very much easier for the violinists. Baroque violin has a much shorter um, fingerboard, as you can see. And you cannot see the inside of the violins, but there is something called bass bar and sound post. And bass bar in the Baroque violin is thinner, and sound post is shoulder. shoulder. Another thing that you can notice is that I have gut strings on my Baroque violin. On my modern violin, these are metal strings, or they have gut core, but outside of the strings, are metal. Basically, the um, idea of Baroque violin is that overall, ten overall the tension is a lot low. When you are listening to the harpsichord, you can think about the difference between harpsichord and piano, the difference in its sound, and that's the difference between the sound of Baroque violin and modern violin. I always love to tell people that my modern violin was made in 1839 in Italy. My Baroque violin was made in 1995 <laughs> in Rhode Island. <laughs> so the difference is in its history. My modern violin went through many surgeries to become what it is. My modern violin also had many owners before me. My Baroque violin, I am the first owner, and I actually know the maker. I talked to the maker, and he and I talked about what kind of sound I prefer and what makes me feel comfortable when I play. And I helped him set up this violin. So the term original does not mean that all those instruments come from the 17th and the 18th century. 
Although there are instruments that have survived from that time, I'm sure you all have heard of Stradivarius and Guarneri, and all the soloists play on them. However, when they were born, they were not in that shape. All those instruments that the soloists play and, and produce such big sound, they went through many surgeries to get to where they are. The idea of sound, the idea of um, pleasing to your ear, it has changed over the centuries. The artistry of making violins reached its apex in the 17th and 18th century, and no one thought you could make any, anything better. But people were not happy with the way violins were. So virtually all of these instruments that, that we know of the 17th and 18th centuries, um, they all were altered to bring them into the line with later ideas of tonal quality and strength in a violin. I also brought all my bows today. I own four bows. Um, I own four, four bows and three of them are historical bows. So this is my 17th century short bow. This is also called the dance bow, Monteverdi bow. And as you can see, it's very short and it is very light. The wood is very straight. You really cannot put too much pressure at the tip. The sound decays like right away. It's very pointy, not just to look at, but the, the sound it makes. I'll play just a very little bit of Bieber so that you can hear how fast the bow moves. It really, it, it can be very, very, very fast. You just heard my um, 18th century Baroque bow. Bows from this time have many variations. There was no standard length, weight, or shape for the bows from this period. Italian and French composers, they started composing more and more solo pieces for violin, featuring lots of virtuosic passages. The bow had to do more, so the bow got longer and longer and became more lyrical. The shape of the Baroque bow is still pretty, pretty much the same. It's very straight and it gets very pointy and the sound really decays at the point. This is called the transitional bow. This is the bow from the time of Mozart and Haydn. So just like its name, it's transitional. It's just going ahead to, to really look at stronger, bigger sound on the violin, but it still has that lightness and it moves very easily. It's lighter than my modern bow. If you can notice, now the shape of the wood changed. There's a concave in the middle, and that is because we wanted the bow to stay healthy at the tip. We didn't want it to decay as much. So we wanted the sound to be a little bit more the same from the frog to the tip. The bow is also longer and it's heavier, definitely, than my short bow and my Baroque bow. Now, this is my modern bow. As you can see, there's a lot of metal that comes into the place now. It's much heavier than my other bows, and you can see the shape of the wood that it goes, it dips in. It was um, François Tort, the French bow maker, between 1875 and, I'm sorry, 1785 and 1790, who made a bow 
um, standardized. He found this wood, Pernambuco wood, and discovered that af after roughly heating the straight bow stick, you can bend the bow just to the desired concave shape and preserve the natural elasticity of the bow. He made a tip heavy. Now we're looking at about 90 degrees. And he made the um, frog heavier to counterbalance this part and this part. I will be playing my modern violin later, and I don't want to shock you with a um, pitch 440 yet. So <laughs> I'll play that later. But I want to talk about how Baroque bow definitely has a limit. And it's true with the Baroque violin. There is a limit that we cannot make a really big sound and we cannot sustain the sound as you would play in Brahms or Schumann. But my teacher in college used to always say, it is not a limit in a negative sense. When you are given the limit, you start becoming creative. You start thinking about what you can do to make more colors and have more nuances with what is given to you. I cannot play Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto or Schoenberg Fantasy on my Baroque violin and my Baroque bow, bow but it's a different project on Baroque instruments. I find it actually much harder to play, but it takes intention, it takes real effort to really hear what you're doing and to really make sure that the sound you're making is what you want. The idea of performance practice is a movement that started in the early 20th century. People started wondering how the music of the 17th and 18th century, including the music of Bach, sounded at that time. And this was actually both for the performers and the scholars. People started asking questions. What did Bach really hear when he composed these cantatas at his church? What kind of instruments are appropriate to recreate the sound and the experience that Bach had? People also started playing from the manuscripts and Urtext edition. That means there's no indication of bowing, fingering, sometimes dynamics. You have to create according to your musical experience and your musical background. Growing up, I found Bach very difficult. Um, I only knew Bach's concertos and solo partidas and sonatas. But there were always lots of chords, which I hated, and double stops, which I couldn't play in tune. There were lots and lots of notes without that many rhythmic changes for me to really breathe and think about where I was going. Oftentimes, the keys were very awkward. They were not easy to play on my modern violin. Once I got older and started playing the Baroque violin, I have had many chances to play in Bach's cantatas, passions, chamber works, and other compositions. I felt that I entered into a new, completely new world when I started playing these bigger pieces by Bach. Bach was a different composer from what I had known. I was fascinated to know how many extraordinary pieces were out there by Bach that I did not know about. How many different layers of information Bach put in his compositions. And how perfect his pieces were mathematically. I'm sure you have heard of all the numbers that Bach was obsessed with. Another thing that really fascinated me was that Bach shared his spiritual journey 
through his music in so many of his pieces. I realize I'm joining a crowd of people who have always been obsessed with Bach, musicians and non-musicians, who have already devoted their lives to studying Bach's music and Bach's philosophy. We all find it impossible to know everything about him, especially his personality. But Bach always humbles us with his genius mind. In 1799, the leading musical periodical of the day published a diagram created by Coleman. It was called A Son of Composers. Bach is right in the middle of the sun. He is the center of the sun, surrounded by Handel, Graun, and Haydn, who are also surrounded by many other composers from the 18th century Germany. People call Bach the man from whom all true musical wisdom proceeded. Bach's musical science, its beauty, its expression offer a stable frame of reference in music that no one else has provided for us. According to Christoph Wolf, his biographer, Bach's music is the kind of musical wisdom that is experienced alike by the keyboard beginner playing the two-part inventions, by the virtuoso tackling the unaccompanied cello suite, by the beginning harmony student and the mature composer, by the inexperienced listener and the sophisticated concertgoer. Throughout his life, Bach constantly strove to perfect himself in his quest for true musical wisdom. Bach in music is Newton in science. I recently read a book by the conductor John Elliott Gardner. It is called Bach, Music in the Castle of Heaven. And I really enjoyed what he did to describe Bach. He says, intertwined in the music and situated behind these pieces formal outer shell are the features of his in intensely private multifaceted human being. Devout at one moment, rebellious the next, deeply respective, re reflective, excuse me, and serious for the most part, but lightened by flashes of humor and empathy. These are the tones of someone attuned to the cycles of nature and the changing seasons sensitive to the raw physicality of life, but buoyed up by the prospect of a better afterlife, spent the company in the company of angels and angelic musicians. His music gives us insight into the difficult experiences he must have suffered as an orphan, as a lone teenager, and as a grieving husband and father. I do not think Bach was a, an easy person to approach. He was rather intimidating, and we know he was very impatient, and he strongly disagreed with the authorities and the society. But he had profound sympathy for those who suffered and grieved. He understood human struggles. And he believed in the true joy and delight that will come later. He celebrated the wonders of the universe and the mysteries of life after. Again, John Elliott Gardner says, you only have to listen to one single Christmas cantata to experience the festive elation and jubilation in music one beyond the reach of any other composer. He truly thinks that to feel that joy that Bach put in his music is the 
the highlight of our musical experience. The more I got to know Bach's music and Bach as a human being, I was inspired and curious to really know what he wanted his music to sound like. I wanted to understand all that is hidden in his music and wanted to be able to hear and produce the sound he heard from my violin. Using the Baroque violin and bow led me to a lot of opportunities in playing box music in the original form and collaborating with the colleagues who have devoted their lives researching and studying Bach. It truly excited me to be a part of that effort and that recreation. I would not say that I have become an expert in box music because of my Baroque instruments, but I will say I have become much more conscientious and serious about my studies of box music. Someone said that playing early music on these early instruments, original instruments, is like reading a book in its native language. You can read stories written in foreign languages translated into English, but because English is my second language, I know there are certain things that I get really directly from reading a Korean book. Sadly, I think my Korean is not as good as English either. So it's a little confusing because now I've been here a lot longer. But there is something about the native language, the experience that, that you can get when you know the culture, background, and history behind a book. I titled this talk, Do We Really Need Period Instruments to Play Bach? The answer is no. You don't have to play period instruments to play Bach. But I would like to change the question now. Do we need to know these tools to work and understand what Bach and his audience heard in the 18th century? The answer is yes. I do believe we are responsible to know what he heard and we are responsible to know the tools that he had, the forces that he had, if we want to truly recreate his music. There is not enough time today to talk about all the techniques and things that I have learned from playing the Baroque violin. But I thought today I would uh, concentrate on um, using the Baroque bow. I recommend that that would be the, if you're a string player, getting a Baroque bow is the first step to really understanding the sound of the 18th century. I'll be playing first half of the um, G minor adagio from solo violin sonata number one. I'm going to play it on my modern violin first, and then I'll play on my Baroque violin with my Baroque bow, and I would like to explain the things that I do differently. So this is my modern violin, and I need to make sure I'm in tune. Growing up, listening to Grumio, Heifetz, I love their juicy vibrato and just real strong sound. And whenever I teach this piece, the very first lesson, all of my students have the same reaction to this piece.
I have nothing against with that interpretation. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, uh, it makes violin glorious. I think it brings out the fancy lines that violin can do. But when you start using the borough bow, then you can't do what I just did because the sound is going to decay at the tip. You cannot hold the first chord the full length. So now make sure that your ears are ready. We're going half step down to 415. <laughs> Very first chord. Yes, I could vibrate, but that's not what happened before uh, when everybody was playing with a baroque bow. You, you start heavy at the frog, you let the bow decay the sound as you move up. That's the characteristic of the bow and you are not required to change that. With a Baroque bow, you don't fight the bow. You try to let the bow guide you. You know that the sound is not going to be the same, but you try to use the bow and see what it offers you for your music making. Another thing about this particular piece is that Bach had two completely separate things going. There are these chords. In the middle, there are all these fillers, the small notes. So one other thing, about Baroque music is that you have to be okay that not every note is equal. There is a real understanding of inequality of the sound when you start to play um, Baroque style. There is the strong and the weak. And it just goes through everything that you play. There is strong beat and weak beat. There are strong measures and weak measures. There are strong phrases and weak phrases. You have to be okay that you're not going to be able to play everything strongly. Oftentimes people call the modern bow the equalizer because you can make it, you can make everything really legato and, and you do need that when you're playing the slow movement of Brahms. How many hours did I practice to make sure that I do not stop you know, the vibrato and really be able to sustain the sound? But now, that's not what we want. We want to make sure that we bring out strong and weak. So again, I'll play the first phrase again. I will emphasize more on my strongs, which are the chords, and then my weak ones, which are the moving notes. different way of approaching. When I am playing on Baroque violin and Baroque bow, another thing that really inspires me is that the music has to keep moving, moving, moving. So you don't stop the bow, even though your bow is actually not on the string. You just continuously move the bow 
so that the sound flows even in the air and it will taper or it will make a force to go towards the next note when you are using your bow arm in such a way. Um, Stanley Ritchie, who, who, teach, who used to teach Baroque violin at um, IU, said, there's no such thing as a stopped bow. You don't stop the bow until you put it away in your case. Your, your bow just keeps on moving, moving, moving. He also said, there's no such thing as a solo violin sonata because you are playing the bass line, you are playing the melody line, you are playing the fillers. So you're, it's not really a solo. It's just that you're doing everything. Let me say that I actually teach only modern violin students at the moment, and I am very aware that my students don't all own Baroque bows. So in our lessons, we talk a lot about what can we do to have that kind of effect of forever moving bow, and also the, the decaying of the chords, and making sure that we really are aware of the strongs and weaks. It is possible, but it is all about what you hear. Learning how to use a Baroque bow helps us produce the stylistic sound that we want. The famous Baroque cellist, Anur Belsma, who just passed away last year, he was very well known for creating such an like, authentic Baroque sound with his modern bow. He would use his modern bow to play his Bach pieces, and he would use his Baroque bow to play other concertos. He said, what your ear hears, your bow must do. So it is not exactly that just because you have a bow in front of you, you are going to change. It is something about what you hear and what you make your bow do. At the same time, I think it is really helpful to know these tools so that we can try to make things work the way that we hear them. I definitely want to give time to Tommy, so I'm just going to mention one more thing. I think that it helped me a lot listening to good recordings of early music ensembles. Now there are so many people who really devote their time in doing the quote unquote right way. Um, I would recommend uh, the, all the recordings from the Netherlands Society. They are doing this project called All of Bach. They're trying to record all 1,080 pieces by Bach. I think so far they have done about 350. But it is really wonderful to watch how much people care and how much people study the stylistic things so that they can recreate the sound that Bach heard. Now I would like to have Tommy talk a little bit about the harpsichord, and then we will play one more movement for you at the end of our talk. My name is Tommy Morris. I'm based in St. Paul. Uh, yes, I brought this instrument. I have a Honda Odyssey. Everybody asks that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I started my life as a pianist, as do most harpsichordists. So they, they usually start on piano or organ. And um, I wasn't really aware of harpsichords until I went to college. I kind of knew they existed. I would hear it on the radio, this tinny thing, and I would change the channel. Um, yeah, which is kind of embarrassing to admit now because it's, uh, it's my whole life now. Uh, when I started my undergrad at University of Michigan, I started on piano and then I switched. Um, or my piano teacher told me I should take lessons just one semester with Edward Parmentier, the harpsichord professor at University of Michigan. I took a semester with him and then I switched completely over to harpsichord. I stopped playing piano completely, which is not the usual way people do it. Um, most people continue playing piano and harpsichord or continue playing organ and harpsichord and that, that's just not something that I did. I really loved the um, 
the, well, piano is a very solitary instrument. Are there pianists in the room? Okay, yeah, it's just hours and hours by yourself in a practice room. Um, and, then, and then you go and play by yourself on stage most of the time. Whereas harpsichord is all about ensemble and playing with other people and um, continual playing and ensembles. You just have more people around you. So that's really what drew me to the instrument. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that I'm talking a little bit about um, harpsichord versus piano, but just a disclaimer that I'm actually not a pianist at all. Um, however, I've done a lot of coachings with people that play uh, Baroque music on, on piano, and of course it's an absolute legitimate thing to do. Um, so give me one second here, I'm going to rearrange. Okay, so to start, I just wanted to give you just a little bit of history about the harpsichord. Um, the earliest surviving instrument is from, I think it's 1521, however harpsichords were definitely um, around before that, the earliest reference to an instrument that plucks like a harpsichord does instead of hammers like a piano is 1397 um, for an instrument referred to as a clavi cembalum. And this particular instrument had the strings running up and down like an upright piano and or like a harp and, and a keyboard in front. And at some point they figured out that using gravity was a much better mechanism to have the jacks move up and down rather than the complicated way to make the jacks move sideways on the on those original harpsichords. Um, and so the, the mechanism now, and the one that works really well, is just the keys are a lever. You push on one side and the other side goes up and um, a jack sits on the end. So you push the note, and then it plucks on the way up, and then when you let go, there's a little spring that allows it to fall back down. Um, this harpsichord is quilled in bird quill, so the part that plucks a string is um, a feather. And so I usually bring a full feather, but you have to imagine a full feather like this. And then you cut everything off um, in the pith the white stuff inside, you cut all that off and then it slides in. And it's just the perfect shape um, to, to have the sound to pluck, to pluck the instrument. And if you've heard, I wish I had um, an instrument with, with plastic versus quill. This is just a much rounder, sweeter sound, um, but they are a little difficult to maintain. So. <laughs> um, Yeah, so this, this instrument is a copy of what's called uh, the Colmar Rookers, which was a, an instrument built in 1624. And it, it looks pretty much like this. The designs on the front were similar to this, um, the gold, the painting. And afterwards, you're welcome to come up and look inside. I'd love to show you the soundboard, which is really beautifully painted as well. And so getting to Bach, when you look at the inventory of Bach's instruments at the time of his death, he had harpsichords, um, spinets, lutes, string instruments, and then there's something called a Lautenbeck, which was um, strung in gut. And it sounded um, a lot like the lute, but it was more resonant and louder. Um, but he did not have any pianos or clavichords in his collection, though I'm sure he um, came across them. So the forte piano, or like the early version, which I think is more like the equivalent of what Kanwan showed you, um, the early violins versus the modern ones. We had, there were forte pianos that evolved into the modern piano. They were invented in 1698 by Cristofori, who described it as a harpsichord that plays loud and soft, or forte and piano in Italian. So that's where that name comes from. However, their very complicated mechanism made it very expensive. And so um, at that early time, they were mainly owned by royalty or very rich people, um, including like Queen Maria Barbara of Spain, who was a student of Domenico Scarlatti. So if you play Scarlatti on the piano, then you know that it was, uh, it was written for piano. Um, however, Bach did not write for forte piano. 
um, they were just completely different instruments, although they're related. So it's kind of the way, um, have you all seen a viola da gamba? Do you know that instrument? Yeah, so it, so some people think, oh, the, the gamba is a predecessor to the modern cello, but it's not. It's just a completely different family of instruments. And that's, I think, how you can think about harpsichords and pianos. And sort of the same thing happened with the harpsichord is when, um, when music making called for louder instruments to be played in larger halls, eventually the harpsichord just wasn't the right instrument for that and the piano took over. Um, let's see, however, you know, we all grew up learning Bach on the piano. Um, you know. Um, and, and these pieces are delightful to play. We learn the, the two and three part inventions, um, French suites, preludes, and fugues. And um, my memory of learning these pieces on piano was I didn't really understand how they went, so my teacher showed me how to do it, and then I copied it and did it. Um, and when I hear recordings of myself or listen back, I think they're, they're pretty good and stylish because I, I had a really great teacher and she showed me exactly what to do and how to do it. But I would say I didn't really understand why I was doing it. So when you're learning piano or on a modern instrument, usually the earliest composer you learn is Bach. And then you play everything later than that. So as you think about Bach on piano, I would just sort of reframe it in your mind and think of Bach as the culmination of this period, so not the earliest composer moving forward into Mozart, Brahms, Beethoven, Brahms, um, but the end of, of many composers that came before. So he was born in 1685, died in 1750. By the time he died, his sons and most composers we're already moving on and playing much, um, or composing very different styles. They were moving into what would eventually become the classical style of music, such as Mozart. Um, but Bach was kind of looking back at older styles, and he was considered in his time very old fashioned. Um, however, his music was always studied as, as for composition, he was just. I mean, just many scores of his music passed around by students. It was really music to study compositionally. So when you play something by Bach, now that I, I've really, I just figured this out, I've been playing harpsichord for 25 years, can't believe that. Um, and now I think how different it is when I look at a piece by Bach, because I don't see something where I'm not sure how to do it, what tempo, what is it referring to? Um, how do I figure out how to play it? Um, is this loud or soft? Is it, is it fast or slow? Now I see all of the history behind it. When I look at a piece, I see if it's a dance movement, if it's in a French style or Italian style. And all of these, um, these things give me information about how I would play that piece. So I'm gonna give you just a few examples of this. Um, a very basic one is just a dance, uh, a minuet. So if you open up a box suite and you're playing a minuet, most people think of it, they think, oh, it's a dance in three, and they often end up playing it like a waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three. However, if you look at the steps of a minuet dance, it's a set of six steps. And it's one, three, four, five. One, three, four, five. So that's very different than a feeling of a waltz. So when I play a minuet, I keep that in mind. It, um, I, I am no dance, baroque dance expert, but I did take a few workshops. So I learned how to dance a minuet, and that's one of those dances that I often teach to kids because it's pretty easy. Um, and when you dance it, there's kind of only one tempo you can do it at, or it's very clear. There's a, you can't do it too slow. It's, it's too hard to do the steps. You can't do it too fast. You can't move your feet that fast. So when you know the, the dance steps of something, it, it gives you the, 
uh, like a range of what the tempo is. So then you would know what tempo to play it at. You would know which beats to accent because of how the steps go. And um, when I teach now anything, uh, any dance suites by Bach, and there are a lot of them, the French suites, Partidas, the English suites, um, then I tell them, we go on YouTube and we look up that dance. It's pretty amazing now. So you can look up Baroque dancers on YouTube and see them dancing in Alamont or a Courant or a Jig. And then um, it gives just a different feeling. Then when you go back to playing that dance movement on the piano or harpsichord, um, you just, it indicates what that tempo should be. And Kang Wan talked about this strong and weak beat. That's very important in dance. Um, and when you learn the dance steps, you find out that the, on the strong beats, you go up on your toes. So strong is an up motion. It's not a down motion. It's not down, it's, it's up, it's lifting up. And that also kind of changes how you might interpret um, the music of Bach. So I have a few examples. One thing, well, this is my favorite piece of all time. Who knows the Goldberg variations? It must be everybody. <laughs> um, this is the first piece that I heard uh, that really made me fall in love with Bach. If I could only have one piece of music this is, that I would play for the rest of my life, this is, this is what I would choose. There's 30 variations. They're all different. They're all beautiful in all different styles. Um, and the aria, is a really great example of something that when I first looked at it, I saw it as like, oh, it's an aria, it has a very pretty melody and pretty harmonies. Now when I look at it, I see something that is very French, that has written out ornamentations, um, that Bach, because I just, I can picture him doing this. He just, he wanted it done a certain way, so he wrote out the ornaments, whereas in French music, you might just put a symbol on it. So uh, there's a figure, like in the fourth measure, it's written out. In French music, it would show the third with a slash through it, and you would just, you would roll it in the direction of the slash. However, Bach wrote out every single note. So when I see a piece like this, sometimes I go through, and I cross out the notes and I put in what the French symbol would be because it changes how I play it. Then I don't play it so strictly in time, I play it like an ornament. So. spot like that on the second half there's this part uh, it has this so it has uh, these 30 second notes and I have it crossed out in this little swirl because that ornament is that's, that's the French ornament for that for that um, that group of notes and then the other thing that has really taken me a long time to be okay with this, because um, I did grow up listening to Glenn Gold play this, and it's a very specific, it's my favorite recording, I have to admit, of the Goldberg variations, um, that because it's so French, I now think probably it could use some note in the gal or any quality of the notes. So it was a very common French Baroque thing to write music out in a certain way um, or could write it out equally with the understanding that the performer would then play them um, in equal, in some way. So if something is written,
which then uses like some inequality. I added some ornaments into it. And then I also did not only just this kind of inequality, but the other way. We group the two in the other direction on occasion. So then that, that gives a whole lot more variety to that phrase than if you played exactly what was written on the page. And I think for some of us, that's very hard to do with the music of Bach. We kind of like bow down to what's on the page. And I would say it's, it's really more recently that I feel very comfortable now adding notes to it and ornamenting the, the music of Bach and maybe changing the, um, the rhythm slightly in very specific cases. Um, so, let's see, I have some other examples in here. Another thing that you can do, which is really fun on any instrument, um, is, and I think sarabands are the easiest thing to do this with. So if you're, you're playing any of, the, any of the French suites, any suite with a saraband in it, um, and you know everything is A-A-B-B, there's repeats on everything, um, maybe add ornaments to your second time through in some way that is appropriate to, to the music. So, and oftentimes Bach highly ornaments it already on the first time through. So sometimes when it's very highly ornamented, I actually simplify it down for the first time through and then add those all back. Because what happens in our, in our publications of this music is um, these four, they're copied by student after student after student, and each student adds more to it. <laughs> so it, it just becomes a collection of the thoughts of many, many people, and then they get printed in our, in our books. Um, and we feel like, oh, we have to do everything that's in there. But it might be that um, most of the ornaments are not actually in box hand. It was just, it was a student that wrote them in um, when studying the music of Bach. So it's okay to take them out. Um, so this is a saraband from the G major French suite, the fifth suite. And I'm gonna play, I'm gonna try to play exactly what's written on the page. Now I'm going to try to add in a bunch more. So you can take any piece and add more ornaments to it. And that, that really then becomes a thing where you're joining first a beautiful composition by Bach, and then you're putting part of your own self into it. And I think with this music, when you, when you allow yourself to do something like that, it brings it alive in a way um, than if you played exactly what was on the page, because you're putting you're putting a little bit of yourself into it and mixing it and then presenting it um, out into the world. So um, one thing that I really love about playing the harpsichord is this ability to do that. It feels very alive and present to me, um, rather than 
something rigid or a reproduction of something very old. It always, it, it always feels very new to me. And I think that might be also just a part of what it's like to be a harpsichordist because there's so much improvisation just built into the practice of playing the harpsichord. Um, like when you're playing in an ensemble, uh, you have the left hand written out and then figures that indicate the harmonies and then you get to improvise. And that's, that's just really so much fun. So then the last thing I want to talk about, um, so yeah, there's ornamentation, there is uh, this Frenchness that you can add to it. I think another thing that you can do as a pianist, especially that sometimes I find missing in piano performances, is you have, um, you have the use of dynamics, which is so helpful. You can use dynamics to show where something is strong and weak. Whereas on harpsichord, you have to do it with an articulation. To bring a note out, you have to put a space before it in order to have that note sing. And I always wondered, I mean, I try to do it on piano, but because I'm not really a pianist, I don't think I do it very well. But I'd love to hear just a, a really good pianist add this kind of articulation in, in addition to all of the wonderful colors that are, that are on a piano. Um, and to not skip that one. I think maybe sometimes the use of the pedal can kind of cover some of that up. Um, so I think if I were a pianist, that would be something I would experiment with a little bit more to see what can I do without a pedal and dynamics in terms of articulation, and then what happens when I add those things back in then to give it just a, a bigger array of color um, and tools in your your fingers to use when expressing something. Um, the last piece that we're going to play is a cantabile, and it's an alternative movement from an early version of the Sonata in G major for violin and obligato harpsichord. Obligato meaning all the notes are obligatory. And you'll hear in it, it's very, very ornamented. Um, there are lines, I don't know if you'll be able to see this. <laughs> Yeah, so there are lines in the violin, with all of these scales. I would call this sort of an Italianate ornamentation written out by Bach. But then also, there are like symbols, the very open phrase sounds very French to me. So I think in the end, Bach is influenced by all of these things, and then he, he brings them together in a way that is unlike any other composer. Um, also, this is just the most beautiful melody. So, some people say, like, oh, he was really great at fugues, but I don't know if he wrote, could write really great melodies. Anybody who's done any of the, the cantatas know that's not true. He's just a brilliant writer of melodies. So, this piece here is actually, um, it survives, no, it does not survive. It's, it's um, a transcription for harpsichord and violin of a uh, secular aria cantata movement that does not survive. So I just wish I, I knew the words to this piece. So yeah, I think listen to all the ornaments and the types of inequality and articulation and all of the things that we talked about, I think you'll hear it in this piece. <laughs>
mentioned that the violin was up against the chest for her bicycle when the Baroque people were playing. How does that affect the way that you play the violin? Have you tried to play it Yes, so um, in the early days, people did play um, bottom here, like, you know, holding the violin here. I have tried and I could not shift. <laughs> I just could not do it. I also was told that violins were a lot smaller in the 17th, 16th centuries. The bows were a lot shorter. Um, violin was, in the very beginning, violin was used only as um, an accompaniment to a dance. So people would be dancing, and the violinist would be dancing with them, and then just whip out the small violin and small bow and, and accompany the dance, and then go back to their pocket, I guess, and then do it. I myself have never tried. There's also um, a teacher in the Netherlands who insists that you really are not supposed to put your chin down at all. I know a lot of people um, have studied that you have to keep your neck straight and then um, chin never goes down on the instrument. I also find that really hard to, to shift. Um, I know people have dropped their violins <laughs> learning that technique. I think the idea is that when you are not pressing it down, the instrument itself rings better. Um, today I didn't have time to go, go on about the technique, but it's really hard to shift on borrow violin because there's no chin rest. So you end up doing a lot of things with your hand and with your wrist, which is a no-no for my modern students. <laughs> I don't let them do that. But you need these little tricks, different tricks, to be able to do that. And to answer your question, yes, I know that was a common practice, but I have never, personally, never succeeded. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I would like to thank Bach Around the Clock for asking me to, to do this talk. It has been really good for me to think through my journey, um, just, just why I do what I do with the Baroque violin and wanting to know more and more about Bach. So thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>